It's like doing Christopher Walken impressions. You so sick of that that no, you can't do I'm it not. Anymore? It's just like there's a lot more to say. But I always like if I open with it, I disarm the audience, and then I sort of I'm like give me back my bullets. Ow! I just take their sort of ammo away because they get anxious. Like when is he doing it? Why do you? Here's a question for you. I can't imitate anybody like that. Who's he's like an iconic figure. Is there some level that there would be some part of me that if everybody asked me, hey, can you uh, can you imitate Christopher Walken or can you imitate Barack Obama that it would get annoying because they're, they're asking you not to be you for a second. And it's like that would just be really irritating. Well, I, I brought it to the table in all yeah. fairness. True. And I brought it out like, here's what I can do. Ta-da! The dance that we do to get attention. Yeah. As like mini narcissists and uh, egomaniacs. And before we harness it and to use our powers for good. So, but that's why they bought the ticket because they like that. So, if they like that, I can't penalize them. Yeah. Uh, I, I mean, just don't want that angst. Like, is he doing impressions? Because this is. Happen? He's talking about his mom's Alzheimer and talking about blowing a kid when he was 10 years old. And like, this is a little uncomfortable, but he lets us off the <laughs> hook and we do laugh. And then I'm way, I just walk in. So I could just walk out on stage and just say, I did a movie with Christopher Walken, and, and they applaud, and then it's, then I can do Tracy, I can do the Chris Farley story, I can do Norm MacDonald, and, but I don't know if you know the secret to that one, you know. <laughs> Jordan is, uh, where it really, uh, well, it clicked in for me, you know, is uh, you have to touch your, your lip, because I, I used to be a smoker, you know. But if he touches his lip when he's on, I realize all of the stand-up specials, if he's a little bit uncomfortable and I'm projecting, he touches his lip like he's smoking. That's oh, what, interesting. So when I started touching my lip, it, it got better. That was obviously not <clears throat> an A-plus version. Like Pacino, like there's a whole run of impressions. So if I just put impressions on like bullet points, that's 20 minutes. How are you noticing when he's uncomfortable and then he's like, like that's his tell? That's like a, it's almost like a poker thing. Oh, he's if touching I, his lip. Uh, I just noticed he, he touches his. I, I don't. I'm projecting the uncomfortable entirely. Yeah. yeah. But I noticed the lip gets touched uh, intermittently, and I wasn't doing it. And then when I did it, I became more. Nor, I, I, I became a better impressionist. Um, so I don't. I don't know if it's because he's uncomfortable. I, it's just projection on my part. But you know it's amazing like every impression has and Kevin Pollock and I spoke about this a lot every impression has a phrase or a word that you can hang your hat on as lost as you get in the Winchester Mystery House huh. you can always circle back to the front entrance by like Kevin Pollock said Shatner he, he has to picture a marion a marionette doll like whoa like that every time he talks it's cuz somebody's pulling the strings oh interesting and like with walking it's uh yeah the word yeah and I realized with all of my impressions, it's yeah or yes or something affirmative. Huh. And I did all of them in a row once at this theater. And uh, I was down at uh, the Shrine Auditorium. I go, here's all my impressions in a word. And I went through all of them. And it was all like Tracy Morgan. Yeah. Al Pacino. Oh, yeah. Yeah. All right. And then like Norm, like, hey, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So and I realized all of them were affirmative and yes. And I don't know if they say even say those in movies. But Who knows? I, I don't know. Very odd to me. You've been doing this for a, a long ass time. You started comedy when you were sixteen. That seems irresponsible on behalf on the part of many many adults who probably should have known better. I like uh, the the idea of many many adults keeping track on my whereabouts is uh, if that was the case, I wouldn't be in show business at all, probably. So it was like my mom and dad were really uh, passively supportive. They never said, don't go. I would uh, go not on a school night, like on a Saturday. The first open mic I did ever was Sunday at noon in the basement of this club called Rascals in West Orange. And it was like, hey, if you're a teenager between, and then they put between the ages of I remember the ad between the ages of 13 and 18. I'm like, uh, 17, I'm like, that is a teenager. Well, that's yeah. copies. Like, even then, I'm like editing. Like, that's got to go. No, don't need that. And then I went at noon and I did stand up. I didn't drive yet. My friend James Barone, who I named uh, the guy in the sketch Good Morning Brooklyn after, uh, he drove me. And you're doing stand up for other teenagers doing stand-up for the first time. So what's amazing about comedy, and Buddy Hackett told me this, 
the first time you do it, you're using 0.1% of what you're able to do if you keep going. But still somebody sees something in that 0.1% where they go, what are you doing Wednesday? Because there's an open mic in Hackensack. And then Wednesday, Hackensack, you're like at 0.01% because you suck. And somebody goes, you know, Saturday nights, there's this place in Montclair. And then you find your tribe and you realize that's why I never fit anywhere, uh, fit in anywhere. I was a wrestler, which is monastic life uh, living, like just, you're just alone. Jumping rope in the shower, trying to lose weight. In the sti- yeah, whatever. I mean, there's not, what are you going to talk to uh, like a pothead about in history class if you're just going, I got a pound and I have to go. I know I can make it, but what, should I just eat that spinach that's in my locker? Or, and this guy I'm wrestling pinned me last it's just, and so a comic and a wrestler, you just keep putting yourself farther out on this island. It's like probabilities, you got to multiply them and they become smaller, right? Like when you multiply one fourth by one eighth. So you multiply wrestler times comic and you end up with this like weird sliver reclusive personality type. Yeah. And then when you land there, you're 100% fulfilled with the other one quarter versus one eighth. Uh, if that's, that's your aggregate. Yeah is people that are also way out on the island. It's like the land of like broken toys. Gee, yeah, the island of yeah misfit toys, exactly. I, I read Gasping for Airtime. By the way, I used to wear drag car noir as well. Um, yeah, you speaking know Speaking of irresponsible. Up, right? <laughs> you know? car noir means you got a nice Camaro, hose the driveway, hopefully she got a big bush, right? <laughs> I mean, hey. nobody nobody's perfect. Uh, I, had, I had friends that were African-American and they were like, yo, this is the shit. You got to get drag car noir. And it never occurred to me that I would wear this and teachers would be like, what the hell is that? Because yeah. it's never, you can never put on a, like I'm wearing Hani Mori today because I realized I look like ass. And, it's still uh, good though. I, but it's not like uh, in your face. Cologne fascinates me. Like the idea of, I want people, like I can meet people at a party and I've been trying to do this somehow in a bit, but I'm not, a, a, for, for stand up, I'm a horrible writer. I'm a great, this happened. Oh, uh, really? Like so my, you don't think you can write as well as you can just retell a story about something? No, because one's the truth and the other one is something I'm trying to construct that's just a funny idea. Right. And that's my mistake for the first, well, not a mistake, but the the <clears throat> the fool's errand, and I think for most comics, comedy now, like Louis C.K., Bill Burr, um, when Cat Williams was like at like just clicking, it's the truth. Like, it's the truth, what he's saying. And so if you're going to sit down and write material, I had this epiphany. Like, there's no big break. If you have a big break, you're in a horrible vocation. You may, as Dennis Miller would say, you've made a horrible vocational error somewhere along the line. If you have a name tag and steel tip chucka boots, you should have like 40 big breaks. Being born is a big break. Your great, 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 great grandparents have to meet and fuck in another country. Right. That's, Usually another country. Yeah, that's, so already, about. statistically, you're at negative, negative, negative numbers. So I realized the, the big, big break for me was about, I don't know, three years ago where I realized my entire show that hasn't been written yet already happened to me. So I got to just buff the rearview mirror right. and stop going, cologne, why do we need to be smelled? It's funny, though, like at a party... And then after we leave, like, it's like you have, like, this tail. Like, hey, he was the guy that uh, I met him. He was fucking fascinating. He was sharp. And my wife had that, uh, that meta. She, he had an EpiPen when my wife got, he saved my wife's life. And he smelled uh, like lilacs. But that cologne was weird. That he yeah. Had. Like, why yeah. do we need to smell a certain way? Yeah, it's, it is strange, but smell does go from, it, it goes directly to the memory part of your brain. And I don't mean it goes there physically. There's brain science behind this that I'm just blowing right now, but it goes to the memory part of your brain. So it triggers something and it has less to do with the cologne, right? If it smells like your grandma, you might be like, that guy was just such a grandfatherly like figure. No, he just smelled like your grandma's house where your grandpa lived. And so you feel comfortable. Whereas it, another person goes, actually, he smelled like, uh, you know, he reminded me of, a, a, something really negative and it's like oh well you sizzling know, you, and hot garbage yeah you, you, you know you buried your dog and that kind of flower was nearby and so you felt sad <laughs> you know it's fucking weird Do they make that cologne yeah if you've ever buried your dog near lilacs yes you want to try dog lack uh it's daddy it's all daddy dog shit. lack it's daddy issues daddy and granddaddy and yeah and mom and dad why and am i dad. sleeping in pajamas because i realized i look uh, a lot more attractive even though i'm in home alone if i got the fred mcmurray pajamas with the piping 
<laughs> instead of my Jets shorts and a T-shirt that says, the more I drink, the better you look. Does it, ha- does it have like a little unbuttoned in her in the back so you can go to the bathroom? No, that's the Michael Landon, and I like that you brought that up. That's very well done. But I've noticed like uh, everybody's like disconnect. Everybody's like uh, the, the shaking of the birdcage that's screwing everybody up. It's all tied to trauma, and by trauma, it's any definition, like car accident, and I don't, I would never get into it with somebody. I just need them to know, like, when I say trauma, I just, that's all I mean. Because I don't want people to go like, well, because I don't want them to back out because they were, like, raped or something horrible. Right, yeah. And it's it's either father or mother. There's two pillars that, you know, and uh, rarely it's both because somebody had to be there. Um, and then... It's it's fascinating, like it, it, the daddy thing. I do this thing on stand and stand up now. It's like when I first was single, after the divorce, I met this uh, actress by chance at the comedy store, and it was like four married couples. And a, a, you, if I said her name, you would know her. And uh, they go, "This is so and so," and I go, "Hi, nice to meet you. You need a daddy." And I'm like, what the fuck are uh, you you're saying? Like, Why did that just come out of my mouth right and now? And I realized what am I, I, have, I never cheated. I lived a monastic life, like never cheated, never looked the other way. Ten years. And I'm like, well, you know what? Sin bravely. And she goes, uh, can you sw- I guess I'm, uh, we're swearing? I, no, I heard the one you guys did. One of your many uh, Mondays, you guys were all throwing the F word around. So, uh, it's possible, she, yeah. She goes, what the fuck did you just say to me? And then I do it now on stage. I go, that's where you guys would tap out. But I don't back into my parking spot for no reason. So I looked at her. I go, I said, Missy, look at me. Hey, look at me. Missy, I said you need a daddy. And that girl goes, go on. Yeah, continue. And I was you've like, got my, you've got my. wow, that's a bell I can't unring. Nothing happened because I just ducked out after that. But I'm like, people got issues, uh, obviously. Yeah. It's uh, mother or father and then getting in your own way over and over and over. So when I realize my stand up has already happened to me, I that's one piece of my pie chart where I went, Oh, I'm gonna completely get out of my own way and not spend my time going. I mean, I really think uh the fact that there's like glory holes are funny. Like just the idea of like in the restroom here at Podcast One, there's like toilet paper between the crack of the door, like somebody really doesn't want you watching them sitting down yeah. and taking a dump. But at the same time, I'm like, or or the parenthetical of that is, I don't want another cock coming through this again. Like this is too much. Like there has to, they're, they're not going to close this up. I got like, right. I use this regularly. I'm sick of seeing, sick of having my ear tickled. Get yeah, to plug this thing up. That's way funnier than the c word that I used. A ear tickled. If another guy tussles my hair <laughs> while I'm trying to grind one out, I've had it. So you mentioned that the the truth element of comedy is important for you. The the stuff that's already happened. So does that mean when you're acting or doing commercials versus doing comedy, do you feel like that's somehow less truthful? Do you like that less because it's it is constructed, it is fake? You are eating a burger, spitting it out into a bucket, and then taking another bite of another burger and being like Carl's Jr. and then spitting that out and doing it again because it's not quite right. I mean, do you? It's the California burger you're referring to. The California to. burger, uh, yeah. Two patties, uh, grilled onions. Uh, special sauce and I've forgotten the copy. Right. Speaking of glory holes, special sauce on the California burger. Uh, yeah, Lancashire Boulevard. There's an adult bookstore where they make the secret sauce. <laughs> Not for Carl's Jr. because they're fantastic for right. the other uh, groups. Um, I like it more selfishly because it's so much more money. Like if you do a sitcom and you have, like Gary yeah. and Married. If I have to be Gary, everything I'm saying is made up by a group of writers that I haven't met until then. But when acting's good is is it Cagney, Jimmy Cagney? Uh, hit your mark, look the other fellow in the eye and tell the truth. So you just have to, in that moment, you are telling the truth or it doesn't work. And um, so I, I think that's, I mean, any actor, I think, and I'm not putting myself in anybody's category. I'm way, and I'm, this isn't like what was me shit. Like I, I, I'm pretty well aware of the show business middle class and wh- what neighborhood I'm like. I'm not Baltic. On the Monopoly board, I'm around like Vern Werner, 
Vernon, yeah, Ver, Vernon, what are like the this. the purple ones? <laughs> the, yeah, like I'm all right. Ones? Like yeah, I, yeah I, you make one right turn, like I'm right around there. Another right turn, you're looking at like you know you're Alec Baldwin, Martin Shorts, and then the other right turn, you're looking at guys with Sir before their names. Oh, but God. you got to tell the truth when you act, I think, and when you do a commercial, you just in that moment have to be a great liar, but so great of a liar that you're not lying. Like, I'm Gary, this is my kid, and this is my family, and I don't want my daughter to take Chinese. I want her to be able to take uh, boxing, and then the punchline is when I win the argument. The, uh, wow. The punchline was, <laughs> sayonara, Chinese, to the wife, like, proving what an idiot I am, which is truthful. So, um, yeah, I, I think it all has to be the truth. I, I don't know what endeavor you can do great line. Uh, well, negotiating is a lie. Um, yeah. Yeah, subjective, sort of in the moment, based on a projective which is truthful, and then you what you add is I'm, the I'm, boundaries are still truthful in negotiation because you can't say we'll do this, and then it's like crap, we literally can't do that. That's that's contrary to the point of a negotiation, right? It's always bordered by the truth, which is I think where a lot of lawyers go wrong. I used to be one, so I understand. Like it's really tempting to to stretch things, but you can't. You're not supposed to, and it doesn't work in the end. I think if I was a lawyer, nobody would ever go to jail. If I was a defense lawyer. If you're a defense lawyer, you'd, I, you'd that, be so persuasive. Like I'm, I'm playing into like John Ronson's The Psychopath Test. Like I'm, that's a psychopathic thing to say. Maybe. It's only but really psycho if you do it, though. When right? you realize one juror, that's all I got to get. And I could just stand there and go, cell phone towers? I just, I, I, have you ever seen a cell phone tower? Yeah, because I, I don't. You know, where they cover cell phone towers, they cover now with like, a, they don't even do like a full job. They just cover them with a few shrubs. Right. The, the, they, the fake tree. So one. why are they trying to hide cell phone towers? Why are they hidden? So this whole thing, he's going to go to jail for 40 years because of a cell phone tower that they hide from you. Just figure by about that one guy. The, the tinfoil hat guy. That's it? Yeah. And then, like, they're in the room going, yeah, but the thing about the cell phone towers, and you just hope there's not one guy in the jury room going, that's not why we're here. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. You just have, you got Alex Jones in the jury. Oh, my God. Edit that name out. Yeah, I know. Yeah. I know. Yeah. Yeah. Tell me about it. All how, right. how dare you say <laughs> Spiro Agnew? When you're looking at different audiences, when you're doing comedy or, or anything live for that matter, how do you read and adjust to the audience? You know, how do you handle, because you got to be looking at one crowd at one point and going, uh oh, these people aren't in the mood, or they they don't look like they're going to be in the mood for this, or this crowd looks like they're going to be fun. Let me try this this thing. Is that is it based on the crowd, or do you go up there and do whatever you're going to do regardless of whatever you see when you stand on stage? You strike me as a guy that's tried stand up. I haven't at all. Really? No. no. The idea of adjusting, like this crowd looks like they want to have. They're at a comedy club, so they all yeah. want to have fun. I guess that's true. Yeah. And the job of comedy, it, like I could talk about comedy, like. I, it, well, maybe not as accurately, but as, as Stephen Hawking talks about like space, like I could never, st I would just keep going. So they're there. Nobody sees a comic hoping they do poorly. It's uncomfortable. And they give you the benefit of the doubt, the benefit of the doubt. They give you the mercy, like, the <laughs> like mm, what's he doing? So, <laughs> no, I don't uh, do that with the crowd. Um what I will do is I, I can recognize real early if everyone is there to see me or if everyone's there and there's a bunch of people there to see me too. And that's the only, like when you take a golf cart down a hill to go fast and it doesn't because there's that governor on the engine. Yeah. That's the governor on the engine is, oh, they're just at a show and they don't realize uh, there's no show here. Like I'm talking about really <laughs> uncomfortable things, but the people that have vetted themselves in the last three years of my audience, they are brave and trusting, and I take them down weird neighborhood. I, I, they go deep into the woods with me with the faith that there's gonna be a ripcord of hilarity. Sometimes there's not, but I realized it, sincerity will trump. Da -da -da. I was gonna talk about my mom having Alzheimer's. My dad didn't tell us. He said she's getting forgetful, and she came to visit me last April. I opened the door to my house, uh, very LA. I'm like, I'm not gonna pick her up. I'll send a car service. <laughs> so horrible. <laughs> so Los Angeles, like, yeah, no, uh -huh. I, I sent Sal from Aloha Limousine. You're all set. I opened the door, and she goes, "Is my car in the driveway?" 
And I said, no, mommy. And she goes, why isn't my car in the driveway? Whose truck is that? That's my truck. Where's my car? And I said, no. it's probably at your house. And she goes, how did I get here? Why isn't my car in the driveway? That's the first thing my mom said to me. Yeah, you must have been terrified at that point. I was heartbroken. Not ter- I don't have different discussion. Fear is not... It, uh, you don't I, have the fear thing? I, you have the I never have. It's very divisive. When you don't have fear and you don't have doubt, it's like a snowplow out in the real world. But I didn't have fear. I, I like My father never told us this. He downplayed it. And my mom, as I know her, the woman of our dreams, wants to know, is there an upstairs to this building? And then my son walks by and she goes, Virginia, my sister's name. And I went, Oh no. Four days I stayed awake and I was eyeball to eyeball with my mom. I know more about Alzheimer's, I'm guessing, obviously, than like, okay, I finished my first year of my medical school where I specialized in all, because that's all textbook. Sure. I had one patient. It was my mom and it was also my daughter. And I never unlocked eyes. I knew her tells. I knew when she was making something up because she was embarrassed. I knew when, like, she didn't sundown. It was down. Like, she, like, I put a note on the door. It's Tuesday. You're at JJ's house in California. You're safe. Call John. Or it's in the afternoon. You already spoke to John. You're safe. You're at JJ's house in California. He's in the living room. Like, it got, don't, and do not go on the stairs. There, And I realized that'll make a, somebody go up the stairs. Sure. They're wet was what I realized. Right, because no, you don't want her to fall, yeah. No, But they weren't wet. I just realized nobody wants to go on wet stairs. Yeah. So, and then, um, like, I wanted to talk about that on stage. And there was a story in my book, No Wonder My Parents Drank, about my 14-year-old son and I renting a kayak. He didn't want to do it. So I'm like, great. He's like, I'm raising my dad, like an apathetic guy that right. doesn't want to hang out with me. Yeah. And then I realized he doesn't know what kayak is or rental con- conceptually. What I right. could have said, you want a boat? He would have went, Yeah! <laughs> so there's a whole bit about that, and I realized, and when I, I said to my wife, I go, this kayak story isn't working because I'm saying it happened to Mackie. It didn't happen to Mackie. It happened to Jackson. But if I speak about Jackson, I have to tell the audience why he does not live with us uh, without throwing his mother under the bus because right. that's not fair. Right. And then I have to talk about my mom's visit when I realized she had Alzheimer's, and she goes, well, how are you going to make all that funny? And I went, I know. Like big, I was like, yeah. That's and tricky. Then, that's a tricky one. But it's that's the joy. That's the joy. And then I got to like eight minutes left in the set, and I had not start. I wanted to like do the Alzheimer's mix. Then I do this whole thing about having boys. I wish I had a girl. I love the drama. They, you know, they can go. They know who's stealing cable. They know who's sneaking cigarettes after dinner. They're like, he's having an affair and his wife, and he farts when he pees. Nobody likes them. Like they know everything about your neighborhood, and and I was gonna tie it to. My mom asking me to read. I was reading my son Harold in the Purple Crayon, and I was going to talk. She goes, "Would you read that to me when you're done with him, Daddy?" My mom said this to me, and instead of bursting into fucking tears, I said, "Of course, Jeannie." And then I went downstairs and I read. I actually had to read Harold in the Purple Crayon to my mom before I went out to do a show, which I was late for for great reason. And uh, so the whole thing was. All I had in my mind was that, the kayak story and that, and I've always wanted a daughter. I didn't know it was going to be my mom. And then if I put that in the middle of this hour and a half, two hours, I can I can just regenerate this engine and get going. But I've shared something. <laughs> I did it. Like four minutes left, I go, oh, I didn't even bring this up. So I just <laughs> smushed the entire thing I told you at the end, and I learned something invaluable that night. I'm like, this isn't getting a laugh, and I've kind of bummed everybody Is out. Is it getting a laugh? Yeah. Oh, no, there's no laugh. No. It's horrible. And I said, uh, so that's what happened to me uh, right before you saw me walk on stage, and you applauded. So I wanted to tell you, and it was all truth, truth. I'm a lot happier to see you than you know. And just thanks for coming out. And they just like got out of their seats, and I'm like, "Oh my God, sincerity is so powerful." Yeah, of course. There's Especially, no joke. There's, yeah, even with the absence of the laugh, like you said. George Carlin closes one of his specials in it. They're like, "How will the Earth get rid of us?" And it's basically AIDS. Like, well, they seem susceptible to viruses, and if they do it when they procreate, so they'll be reluctant to procreate, and this and that, and 
it's a dream, and we're here for a little while. Anyway, thank you. Like, holy smokes. So everyone leaves kind of like looking at each other and clapping and then realizing that it's more profound than ever? I don't know. Well, I can't speak profound for me. For him, I would hope so. But for me, it was more, it's sharing. There's no show. And if something doesn't work that happened to you, you just move on to the next story because you sh- you hand delivered a story. Like we used to ghost ride our bikes through this mental hospital that got uh, shut down. Ghost ride your bikes? When you hop off the back of your bike and you just watch it go straight with nobody on it and then it goes into traffic and gets run over and you think it's funny. That's uh, terrible. Yeah. But it's if people listening right now are like, oh my God, like we do it off the roof of the house. Your most prized possession is your BMX bike sure, as a kid. Sure. And you leave it on the front lawn and the next morning there'd be frost on it. And you go, okay, it didn't get stolen. Good. Yeah, there's rust on it. And you just ghost ride it and we'd skid through the hallways of this abandoned mental hospital and I realized... There was a time where I went like, you know, and I turned the corner and it's like if the two girls from The Shining were black in the same time, they I turned the corner, they're there, I could, oof, I could see them, pink dresses, white polka dots, pink bows in their hair. We live in a crazy house, but we ain't crazy. They said at the exact same time. And I rode my bike down three flights. First time I realized you can actually take a bike downstairs. It's kind of cool. Right. Three flights. And out the back towards the railroad tracks, which had been pulled up years ago to go back to the back end of my dead end street. So down three flights of stairs, out the back, down a lawn, and I looked back behind me, which means they had to go three flights in that time and get to a window. And they're looking down at me. We live in a crazy house. We ain't crazy. I still don't know if they're real. No, I would assume that they're not real. I had to stop saying it on stage because I didn't want that energy if they weren't real. So I just, if that didn't work on stage, I just go, you know, the bike, when you're on your bike, like I just move, you just move on. It's not like, get a laugh, whack-a-mole, whack-a-mole. It's Bill Evans' piano on Kind of Blue. It's the pauses. It's how little you play. You mentioned that you didn't have the fear thing. Are you talking about in general or just with respect to that topic? Because in Gasping for Airtime in the book, You mentioned that you had panic attacks that you had to deal with on Saturday Night Live. That sounds like fear. Was that something else? Yeah, I'm glad you said that, man. Panic is a neurological glitch. Your body releases endorphins and uh, adrenaline into your bloodstream at life-saving levels for no reason. That's the glitch. So it is different from fear. Fear, stimulus, response, uh, modern fear now is the absolute cause of every argument, everything that you don't do, every life, everything you've settled, the life less lived, fear, 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 fear. That guy beeping at you that's making you crazy, like, what the fuck's with this guy? Fear, he's terrified of something. But panic is a neurological glitch where you have no control over it. So the fear that develops from having a panic disorder is the anticipatory dread of where I might have a panic attack. But that is, that's not the fear that I'm, I'm talking about. I'm, I'm talking about like, hey, you're next to go on stage. You're going to meet the Pope. I haven't. Yeah, <laughs> just, but are you like, oh my God, like I'm crap. Like, yes, like I, I can't, where fear goes is where I can't, oh, I can't wait goes. And if it's a negative, like the dentist has to rip out 16 teeth. Oof. I'm like, yeah, let's get this over with, man. Forget it. Like, let's go. Let's do it. Flying, like I've been on planes that have been struck by lightning three times, and I just—it's it, either is or isn't. I had a entirely divine experience on this one particular plane. That's maybe a little too long for this podcast, but uh, then the next time I was on a plane that got struck by lightning, I thought it was kind of adorable because it was once, and I knew we were going to be okay. So no, I've never going on stage fear. No, well, I, I got afraid before I did April Foolishness for Kevin and Bean one year. And I looked at my buddy Charlie, I said, I'm like t- fucking afraid. And he goes, what? Yeah, what are you talking about? And I realized after the fact, there was so much pot smoke <clears throat> that the symptom of panic is shortness of breath. And the pot smoke made me have a stuffy nose. And you're talking to all these people that you're meeting backstage, so you're not breathing properly. And I got shortness of breath. And that made me start to get that rumble of, uh uh-oh, it had nothing to do with the show. So you just basically physiologically tricked your body into having 
a panic attack or no I, I, you have the best i love your podcast i subscribe it's always oh, in awesome. front of my, I, i've tweeted at you about like the yeah. narcissistic continuum and uh everything you do uh, quick that guy was fascinating oh jim quick there's no way that's his real name it is it's japanese funny? right i that's a great question i'm not sure hey it's like somebody in my family i'll tell you one thing he ain't white okay <laughs> yeah we can ask him i'll tell him yes uh but he was brilliant like uh the story about him and the uh the friend's dad right the friend's dad who took him, under took his... him for a walk like what do you want to do what do you yeah. want to do why would you let school get in the way of this i was like wow so the fear the panic you get symptoms of panic and it takes a while to train yourself. These are symptoms of panic. If you stay up 24 hours because you're working so hard, then all of a sudden your spatial relations are really out of whack and you start getting that nervousness because that's one of the symptoms of panic. And you just slow it down and identify, oh, I was up for 24 hours, I'm seeing stars, and um, I have a stuffy nose. These are symptoms of panic. I have Klonopin in my bloodstream, one milligram a day, every day so it's actually impossible for me to have a panic attack right um so, so you can logic yourself back down to and then to you don't have to anymore then then you, yes and then you don't then you don't have to anymore because you just it's it's just yeah when you drive your car and back out of your driveway like today you didn't go okay 10 and 2 hand on this foot on the brake look over my because that's how you learn to drive right so you, now it just becomes now it's this yeah, it's become this one thing and not these 44 steps. It, it just seems like such a strange and uh, maybe unfortunate setup that you, you're on Saturday Night Live. You're in front of, I don't know, m millions anyway of people. That's the worst time other than when you're operating heavy machinery that you could have a panic attack. Uh, no, I, I, I put it way above heavy machinery because heavy machinery, you could take out the guy you've never liked. <laughs> yeah, right, right. Like if I'm freaking out, bye, Jerry. Uh, yeah, that was bad. And you really did read the book and I'm, thank you. It's yeah. Martin Lawrence was hosting and there was a motivate sort of a motive. Yeah, no, it was a motivational speaker sketch in a van down by the river, but it was in jail and they tied it to a scared straight, uh, right. program sure. where they come out to scare us. And it was brilliant. And I got in it and I was like, I, I can't believe I'm in this sketch with a sentence and it's Chris. Like being around Chris was like Chris having, Farley. The, yeah, Chris Farley. It's like having the sun on your back. Like it was just the mo he was the most beautiful man I ever met, ever. It's like my grandfather, my my pater my uh, maternal grandfather, Red Maurice Ferguson, and Chris are the two people that that that's it. they have they have eternal life. They're never going anywhere. I'm getting choked up talking about them, and so. I remember I'm so excited to be in the sketch, stuffy nose, angst because of the sketch. And like, I don't, I'm so new, I'm so lost on this show. And I go to my dressing room to put my wardrobe on and they gave me these like hipster jeans. This is 1992, wow, 1992. And there was no pockets because I used to take those Klonopin pills and put them in that little tiny pocket above your right pocket, that's the Klonopin pocket. Right, the pocket that's not good for anything else but yeah, and future, handcuff and keys and drugs. Any officers of the law and anybody out there listening, uh, when you pat people down, just check the little pocket. I'm might, pretty sure they know about that one. Uh, no, they don't. I know from experience. <laughs> oh, man. They do not. TSA doesn't either. Uh, I've, <laughs> there is a t So I'm like, where am I going to put my Klonopin? What if the anticipatory dread? What if I have a panic attack on live TV? So I got four or five of them and I held them in my hand because there's no place else to put them. And during that sketch, like I'm, you know, I'm getting all sweaty. You're under the lights and you're a little nervous and my hands are getting sweaty. And I had to hold these pills in my hand in a way where there was enough cracks and space between my fingers, but it, but they wouldn't fall on the floor and right. on in front of millions of people. Like, oh my God, that guy's a drug addict. He's bringing pills. But I also couldn't hold them too tightly because they'd get wet and dissolve. Oh man. And, and I was trying to do like what a magician does, like palm it with my thumb, you know, like pin th three of them. But then that's getting them wet. And then the sketch was over. <laughs> <laughs> that's all you thought about the whole time. I was like never sketch. there. But when Chris came through the doors in rehearsal, you know, it gets rehearsed about four times. He's wearing a prison gray shirt and uh, there's always something. There's 
always something he's going to come out with that's going to knock you on your ass in the best possible way. And between dress rehearsal and air and when it was live, he came out, he was just soaking wet. It was never rare. It was just a prisoner in an outfit. And then, then he comes out. He's like dripping wet from his hair. He's got the most giant pit stains of water. He's got water. It's like he just took a bucket. And he's just drenched. Like the crack of his ass has wet. And his crotch is wet. Like that's how bad he sweats in jail. And the moment he comes through the door, you're powerless. You are power like the sun. You can't stare at it. And uh, there was a mistake in that sketch where they're selling us back and forth for cigarettes, Martin, uh, <laughs> Lawrence, and Chris. And he goes, well, I will sell your uh, uh, punk ass for a pack of cigarettes. And he, Chris wants to speak. So the, the exchange is like the conch on the island is two cigarettes. And then Chris takes the two, uh, gives the two cigarettes, goes to the mic, and he's supposed to say, sold seven bitches to the homie in the cornrows. And he goes, sold seven bitches to the Cormy in the home room. Oops. <laughs> Just oops into camera before he finishes the sentence. And it's bedlam. And we had worked out when we go through the breakaway wall and we all fall on top of Chris, let's all stay on top of Chris so he can't come back out and say live from New York. It's Saturday night. Seven. Tim Meadows, me, Sandler, Spade, Schneider. Granted, half those guys weigh 85 pounds, but he picked us up like leaf bags in your front yard and just removed us because he had to deliver. He's the most fascinating man on earth. He would know when the camera wasn't on him and he would cross his eyes while he was talking to you. So it's like a two shot, two shot, and he would know when the camera was over his shoulder go, how about you young fella? With these big cross eyes and you're laughing. And then between dress and air, Lauren would go, and can we please not laugh in the motivational speaker sketch, Jay? Like, I, I won't, sure. My wig is sliding down the side of my head because he tussled my hair. And I don't know whether or not he could fit. It's, you know what it is? It's, the, it's madness. It's, it's the space shuttle re-entering. We see a fireball. Right. Like panels and shit are flying off. And the guys in the inside are going, all right, Houston, looks like we're uh, 14 minutes from the Indian Ocean. <gasps> like, that's what it's yeah. like, that, that fireball. But... Somewhere in there, there's a calm because you realize what's happening is right. Did you always feel like you belong there? Well, I, let me rephrase that. I know that that's not the case because in Gasping for Airtime, you mentioned something that we hear about a lot from everyone from Navy SEALs to other high performers, which is that you you felt like you didn't belong there. Who am I kidding? They're going to find out I'm not the real deal. It's only a matter of time. We call it imposter syndrome. That was a great episode, by the way. Thank you. And um, you've had a bunch of Navy SEALs on. Mm -hmm. You may well talk to your spy, your spy slash one thousand SEAL missions. Uh, he hey, was on really? more, he was on the More Stories podcast. I go, so what's your job title to Pete? He goes, I fill gaps. And then I go, all right. Half hour later, I go, so real quick, like, what's your actual job title? He goes, I work in a frenetic space. A frenetic space. I'm like, all right. He goes, I watch the people that watch us. I go. That how, sounds like a comic book thing. I go. What's the longest you've ever watched a guy? I will get to your question, obviously. Yeah. And he goes. I had to keep an eye on this Afghan uh, chief for four days because he was like behind this row of bushes. It was about a thousand yards from our Ford operating base, and then eventually I just went up and spoke with him. I go. And did you? After four days, what if you just realize he's just jerking off? And he goes. That has happened. Really? <laughs> oh, Pete's amazing. Uh, so I, I'm being too blue, I think, for this. I, That's I, okay. I respect it. I, this is my favorite podcast. Really? I would never, like, yeah. When I discovered you guys and when my gal came in with Narcissist, uh, Narcissist Continuum, yeah, I Linda went. Yeah, Carol, yeah. She's in my home. You can always tell who the enabler is in the relationship. They're the ones in the self-help aisle in the bookstore. And I just looked up at my bookshelf and I went, oh, Dios mio. Yeah. And then we get better and then the narcissist marginalizes further further away or they turn it. Well, so uh, I did not belong there. The odds of you belonging there are zero because they only hire two people. Who belongs as a Navy SEAL? Like what they put you through. So Navy SEAL, there's an actual test and test and test and they try to break you. And I didn't break. I belong here. So I'm surprised that the Navy SEALs say I didn't feel like I belonged because they did what every other Navy SEAL before them did to belong. Saturday Night Live, I did stand-up comedy twice, 
for 11 minutes, 15 minutes at a time. And then I just got the job, but I was also a writer and I had never wrote a sketch in my life. So I never felt I belonged because how could I? I have no discernible skill as a sketch writer. I've never done sketch comedy before in my life. I don't know where anything is. When I write a sketch, I'll need a pencil and paper. Where would I? Should I go to the store and get those myself? Like, no, everything. It's like conversations on the freeway. No, you, you want to just everything, you know, like just That's nobody. A, it's the office of Saturday Night Live? Yeah, and it wasn't malevolent. There wasn't like this backstabbing cutthroat. Just everyone's surviving, and they will help you eventually if you meet the person that helps you. But like everyone's on computers. I'm writing it out longhand. Where do I hand this in? Oh, you got to give it to Claire. And go, oh, thanks. Who's Claire? Yeah. It's run the entire 17th floor, and it's 3 in the morning. If she's still here... Oh, no, no, she'll be in tomorrow. What time? What? And they're gone. Oh, God. So I knew I belonged once I was in the door. I just knew I needed somebody to go, oh, when you write a... Like, do I put Phil Hartman or do I put dad? Like, I didn't know that if you write a sketch. Like, motivational speaker, dad speaks to his kids. Son, uh, David Spade, daughter, Christine Applegate, Matt Foley... Do I put Chris? Do I put Phil? Do I put do I put all like I didn't know any of it. Yeah, How long the mechanics, is this? Yeah, because I've never like read one aloud. So, but once I was there, I I read the Reeves biography of uh, JFK, and like he when he first ran for Senate, he just looked at Bobby and goes, "I just refuse to wait my turn," and I went, "Wow, like, yeah, like there's this pecking order and especially stand up. Like why did he get the? Why is he on the Tonight Show? He's." I've been doing it so long. Well, maybe you suck. Oh, man. Maybe that guy had the balls to jump to the front of the line. Because yeah. sometimes if you just, you go to the front desk of a hotel and go, you'll take uh, you, you take my Wi-Fi off for me? And they go, why? And you go, I, just because I asked. They go, sure. Sometimes, yeah. Uh, yeah, sure. Hey, 50-50. 10%. You're not really going to charge me for parking, are you? Like, no, I'll take that off. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and delete, and yeah. no consequences whatsoever. So I just knew there was a process where you have to be the bailiff with no lines for a year. Second year, you get a bunch of a couple sketches that you wrote. You know, Christopher Walken, Psychic Friends Network, Good Morning Brooklyn, some update pieces, and um, then the third, fourth year. But I'm, I'm, I wasn't willing to do it because it was hurting me. It was hurting my. I was leaking oil, and I think any performer. And any athlete that you're great, at, you must have this in your on a cellular level. You must know when you're being lapped on the racetrack. You have to know it, otherwise you suck in perpetuity. So when I'm sitting there and I'm the bailiff, or if I yell "All rise," and that's what I did that week on the that was my contribution. A comic who I think is one me. I have always thought highly of myself. Uh, that's what I did on Saturday Night Live. That becomes embarrassing, and I know I'm lucky to be there, but I also know there's a guy that wrote his own pilot, and he's in L.A., and he's going to shoot that pilot for $25,000, and if he gets picked up, he's going to make 50 a week. In perpetu- so I wasn't – I'm being lapped. I got to go. So the neg- they made the decision easy for me because after my second year, they wanted two weeks to decide whether or not they were going to pick me up for right. a third year. Then they asked for another two weeks. Then when they asked for the third two weeks, my agent said, uh, in my experience, people know if they want to work with you or not. And I went, well, then I'm, I'm all set. Yeah. Lauren yeah. said to us once, it, it, he, didn't, he wasn't happy with us. I, I love Lauren. He said, Lauren I Michaels. want him. So I have no bad Lauren stories. He said... Uh, if you don't like the way it is, you could always, there's the door. You could be the third lead on a sitcom next week. And I remember going, oh, my God. That sounds I, awesome. What am I doing here? Yeah. Do I want to be the great SNL guy for seven grand a week or do I want to go out to L.A. and just cha-ching, cha-ching, cha-ching? So after I left Saturday Night Live, two weeks later, I'm on the Jeff Foxworthy show as his kooky brother. He was right. Yeah. There's the door. You could be the third lead on a sitcom. So I I knew I belonged. I also knew this is not how you drive this car. And I knew the no wrong lever. No, like uh, I like the expression, don't spook the thoroughbred. But you got to let me run. Yeah. I'm getting spooked sitting around. 
It's very it was surpri- very surprising to me to read in Gasping for Airtime that you suffered from stage fright as a performer, especially in Saturday Night On Saturday Night Live, it's the worst place to have any kind of stage fright, and it just seems so counterintuitive. And your vulnerability in there is very admirable and almost surprising. In fact, you, you tell a story... And forgive me for bringing this up. I'm sure it's not your favorite story. It's in the book. You stole, right. It's in the Library of Congress. And I was thinking yeah. this as you were talking, by the way. What you're about to say. What I'm about to say? You're going to talk about Rick Shapiro. I don't, is Irish that what bartender. Oh, uh, yeah, the Irish bartender. I yeah. knew what you were going to say when That's you started impressive. this. Well, we're the only ones here. Yeah. So, yeah. And correct me if I'm, I'm wrong here, but... Uh, you, I guess you stole an act for a sketch from somebody that you'd seen it before. Yeah. And then SNL gets sued. How do you shake having a reputation as a, I haven't. a thief of material? I haven't. You haven't? I haven't. And I was being honest. There was an apology written in a best-selling book. I thought, yeah. but let, let's not shit each other. I, in the moment, go, oh, wow. Like, I'll be lauded if I cop to this. I'm gonna oh, get, yeah? Well, yeah. Like, if you're... Because nobody ever does. Well, if you're a narcissist... like. There's a big difference, as you pointed out in the Art of Charm podcast, which, uh, well, sorry, I've been recording a lot. I realize I am on it. <laughs> this is not mine, it's yours. Is... On your podcast, you guys really do a great job of differentiating and separating uh, being a narcissist and having a, the disorder of narcissism yeah. and narcissistic, yes. uh, the narcissistic continuum, narcissistic personality disorder. You have to have narcissism to get straight A's. You have to have narcissism because you want to be a narcissist, you want to please them so much that you're going to work overtime. So, like, for me, like, I'm in, uh, I'm, I'm in uh, AA, right? And when I go through my steps and I realize my resentments and stuff, it all comes back to ego. It all comes back to me. Like, why aren't you looking at me the right way? How could somebody that talks as much as me feel like they're not being heard? Marriage, job, 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 relationship. Like, it's it doesn't make sense. No. But that's, in my childhood... I wasn't because I was a child of an alcoholic parent. My sisters were eight, nine years older than me. There was nobody hanging around with. So if I wanted attention, I had to like uh, jump my bike like Evil Knievel over 18 fucking school buses and learn some show tunes, sing out Louise to get everybody to look my way. So the, the what you have to understand this, Jordan. If I wrong you somehow and I come to you as soon as I can and go, I got to tell you something. That was That was horrible what I did to you. And I'm sorry. And I just, you are going to say to me, I appreciate you telling me that. No, I'm being filled now with pleasure because I'm being, you know, validated per, in yeah. a perverse way, in a very subversive way. You're telling me great job, but it's because I did something awful. Like, bro, you just, you know, you, whatever. Like, you were a little handsy with my bride. I go, you know what? I was really like manic. I thought I was being funny. I'm sorry. I'm really. Did that actually happen? Uh, I, I, what was, hold on one second. Okay. On the uh, era, advice of my counsel, I cannot confirm or deny or answer that question. No. You better not be answering seriously. <laughs> Monastic life. Never. Why do I keep hitting Bert's nose? I don't know. I'm going to move Bert Street. back a little bit. Who's here. your favorite Muppet? Oh, uh, great question. Actually, it's very telling, the answer. You know, it, everyone's it's like you're supposed to say animal no 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 you're not but I, and, and i thought I it somebody was... say prawn who's that well i'm gonna i'm gonna say it's a prawn it, I <laughs> that would, one little I, shrimp i would have said animal up until just now and now i feel like that's just a, a, a thing i was felt like i was supposed to say fear why are you second guessing who you're like let's I'm trying I'm, to think of other Muppets, though. Why? Well, huh. me. Why? On an elemental level, why are you renegotiating who your favorite Muppet is? Fear. Like, we're talking about fear, everyday fear. I know you're I think I, I just try more interested in being honest rather than giving an answer that I think people expect, which is animal. Who's your favorite Muppet? Like, who is it? I don't know all the... I don't know who they are, all of these. I'm not dodging this stealing question. I'll circle back. No, to no, it. it's I'm okay. Good, I'm, uh, I'm it is. It does all track. If you see me do stand up for two hours, you're like, what the? Who, who are the? There's any Fozzie, Jim Henson person that could be like. the Muppet Show, 
That could be the Muppet Show. That could be Sesame Street. Let's come back. Like to Bunsen it. and Beaker, the science guys, but they never uh, said anything. Professor Bunsen Honeydew was Reggie Watts's answer. That's the. Those are the science guys. They never say. No, anything. Guy. no, he talks all the time. He's got to give Beaker instructions, but he has glasses with no eyes. Oh, Scooter that's... has glasses with eyes in them. Is this? Do you know this because you have kids, or do you just remember this? I remember it, and you know, peripherally, I guess, with kids too. Do you like Fozzie because he's a stand-up comedian? I would, I would slit his throat. <laughs> I think he's the most annoying we, Muppet for if sure. If we were on a lifeboat and we were getting a little low on water, I'd go, hey, one of you fish, see what you can catch, and I would hold his head underwater until, the, as John Lee Hooker says, until the bubbles stop coming up. <laughs> I, I, I do like Kermit. I know it's a lame answer, but I Why? like Kermit because he's the lead role. Both of your answers, you negotiated backwards. Yeah, I negotiated backwards. From what I feel you, like they're on From what you like. This is what I'm um, like. Because I want to pick the best choice. But it's your choice. I like fucking Rolf, the piano playing dog, because he wasn't used as much and his fur looked really soft and I needed a hug as a kid. I'm like, he's probably like really huggable. Yeah. But then I realized it's Bert. I love Bert. And on your iPhone. Why Bert? He's never having a good time. It's hilarious. He's, crank he's like a cranky. But he doesn't start oh, that way. Like, Ernie, look at this. You know, I did uh, oh, this right. and that. And then Ernie goes, I can't hear you. I got a banana in my ear. And he goes, no, I, that's that's what I also want to tell you. You got a banana in your ear. He goes, sorry, Bert. Like, we won the lottery. I can't hear you. You got a banana in my ear. And it's the slow burn. That's right. I forgot about it. And that. on your iPhone, there are way too many and not enough Burt memes where they do like a CSI Miami. Like Sesame Street actually did slow pans towards him. He's reading a book. He looks up like he read something offensive. He's got a dead arm. He's lifting a weight and he falls over. Like there's – I encourage all your listeners next time they're uh, sitting down on a toilet uh, to just type in Burt under those memes – and hopefully there's some toilet paper in the crack there so nobody can spy on you. So, Rick Shapiro is a comic, and he is still, and he's a genius. Such a genius, there's like a danger to him when you watch him. There's an uncomfortability. His mind is the next level of mind that has not been harnessed yet. He's brilliant. And he had this sketch, uh, this bit he did about an Irish bartender. Oh, you like stories, do you? Here's a story. You're fired. Get out. He's like, well, I don't work here. All right. Well, how'd you like a job that pays $5 million a week? Yeah. Well, all right. Now you're fired. And it was like two months where I had, in my second season, I had nothing get on the air. And I went, this is bad. So I wrote that as a sketch, which is the sin. There's nothing. Murder, rape, mayhem, pestilence. <laughs> Just yeah. stealing is it. I still have people hashtag me from, you know, fan bases from like other podcasts, like Mince, Mince and Moore. They're like, who'd you steal that from? And uh, it takes a very long time to realize social media is a bathroom stall and people are just writing yeah, shit on it. Of and course. Then, so I put it on paper because the odds of that going through, because everything I wrote, didn't go through. I see Mike Myers write things every week that don't get through. That week, it was the golden ticket. It was just had a halo around it, and it just kept advancing and advancing and advancing. And I'm going, I'm well aware of the cosmic joke that this is just moving forward. Right. Like you're scared now that it's actually going to get picked, even though you wrote it because you were right. not. And I wrote it poorly because Rick Shapiro is a genius. Like I wrote it kind of sloppily. And it got picked to go on the air, but it can still get cut in dress. It can still get cut in the second dress rehearsal, the live dress rehearsal. Nope. So the, for the first time in your career, you're like, please cut this one. Yes. Get rid of it. I made a mistake. And the chapter prior, I believe, ends with, I did the most unthinkable thing. I The worst act, I the worst crime, the sin, I stole. And I went, if I'm going to write this book, I'm going to write all of it. And the narcissist and the ego goes... He's going to get a lot of credit. Like, you know, he was really honest. We were talking about it now. Was it part, was it, was there a part of you that's just doing the Eminem eight mile thing where you're like, let me take all the bullets out of the other guy's gun first. Remember that scene where he's doing the rap battle and he's like, you banged my girlfriend and I went to a shitty school and I'm an idiot and I make spelling mistakes and I barfed all over myself. And then the other guy goes up and he's like, shit, I got nothing to say now. Cause that was all my ammo. 
How's that track though? Help me. I actually don't remember. It was just in the movie Eight Mile. No, how's it track to me stealing? Oh, how does it track to? So you wrote about this in the book because in in a, my hypothesis here was maybe well I have to put this in there otherwise all the reviews are going to be well you left out the part about when he stole that act from that nobody guy. ever would have known non disclosures all around really nobody ever would have known non disclosure Rick Shapiro knew. Yeah, because and that would have been word of mouth it. on a part of the country that I never would have heard about. Right, and so no, it was so it was just going to be inside baseball, and then you just blasted it out to everybody. He's on the team. He's on the. T it happened. He fuck. I launched a fucking three run home run. And I knew what the pitch was. Like it's it's a part of it. It's the history of what it was. And if I was going to be honest, I had to be honest. And it's when I discovered while writing the book, I'm the villain. I'm the guy that I'm the, I'm the monkey wrench. Farley's the hero, um, and I'm the villain. Did my, it affect your career, though? No. It no. affected my heart. It affected my my heart. That's worse. Because when people reach out and they go like, like, well, yeah, but he fucking, st like, I did Marin's podcast, and he just kept pinning me against this wall, like, but you steal, like, you know, and I've known Mark my whole life, and he fucking knows I don't, if you come see my stand-up, it's impossible that a syllable is lifted because, like, my mom's Alzheimer's. My son's name is Meredith. Right, it's all about you. Yeah. My son's name is did, Meredith. Is, it, is that really? My father-in-law is a Meredith. It means Lord of the Sea in Scotland. I didn't know that. I had, you want to know, you know, that's what happens on stage, too. It's interesting. So, like, the idea that I steal, if you come see a show, pick a night, it's laughable. I stole. And I admitted to it thinking, you know what, that'll be a nice, like, we'll put this to bed. But not in today's age of Instagram, no. Snapchat, now, min, minute, min, uh, minute rice in a fucking microwave, like now, now, now. Like the, there's too many bees in the hive and they don't do shit. Thumb thugs and they just want to remind you that you ain't shit, but you are because really? that's why they're reaching out to you. Sure. But at some point you got to go, Greg Proops told me, if you look up anything about you on the internet, you are and deserve to receive whatever is written about you. That's funny. He's coming on tomorrow, actually. He's the smartest man in the world. That's what, it, that's what it says on his cover art. You will have the best time. Cover. So uh, I did it because I wanted to be honest. And I thought, when in life does a human being get a platform where they're going to ship books to different cities? I, didn't, I never left my house. And I get to make it, like, make an amends. And then, like, feedback 15 years later was... I heard Rick Shapiro on somebody's podcast go, well, you never apologized to me. Like, well, I don't have your number. Now I need it. Yeah. Because now for 15 years, you're still so angry with me. And that breaks my heart that yeah, this that guy, sucks. like as an empath, I guess it's, I don't like this guy caring. I did the unthinkable. It's unthinkable. I'll go, like, I'm not going to on my deathbed worry about it and think about it cosmically, but I will never have not stolen again. Like when you cheat on your wife, one time that you might as well keep going because you're not going to go to your deathbed as a great husband you cheated that's why i never cheated like because the one time it's over it takes, takes once so it was very cathartic to get it out and i didn't realize the blowback would be 15 20 22 years later who'd you get that from who'd you get that from? not never at a live show because again it's it's impossible um so it wasn't like taking the bullets out of this. I just needed to be truthful and tell every single thing that happened. I mean, I'll tell you what color the carpets are. They're blue. Everything was blue, including me. So Meredith, I will do so many stories about my boys. And then I uh, say Jackie a lot. And I go, so then I, it'll be about an hour into the show. I go, so I say to my son, Meredith, I'm about to do like a, a four minute chunk here, if that's what you're. Uh, me, uh, literally right now, this is about it. I'm because Meredith, you were like, "Are you being serious?" Yeah, which is the normal reaction. Call him Mackie. That makes sense. Um, on stage, I do like my son. They're idiots, you know. Get out of the tub, put on your pajamas, and then I forgot to tell him to dry his body. He'll figure it out. Too late. Wet carcass. Pajama. Two legs and one leg hole. How boy boys are dumb. Yeah, we know. But, yeah, but without it being like, have you ever noticed guys and girls are different? Uh, but they're. I don't know how my son doesn't drown when it's raining. It's just. <laughs> We're playing a game. Who can run closest to the moving cars? And like, girls don't play games like that. They play how, games. How old is he? Uh, he's twenty four. Twenty four. <laughs> yeah, he just graduated Syracuse with honors, but uh, not. Uh, no, he's he just turned six. Six. Okay. So then, after like an hour of 
talking, sharing, speaking, and a lot of kid stuff, I go, so my son Meredith and somebody will do exactly what you did. And to the well, point where the, son, Meredith. there's a nervous yeah. laughter or like they think it's a bit. Right. And I will just pause and say, you guys, you guys want to talk about that right now? And they're like, yeah, we can't got really kid. say no. So they think the next I'll give you a very truncated version. They think the next like 11 minutes, I'm just like, you want to know what? They don't know I've done it before. So it's fucking silent. Uh, I had full custody of my older boy, Jackie. I just started dating my wife, Nick. And uh, I went to court and I fought for what was right. And judges love moms. We know this. Yeah, I'm not going to say anything negative about sure. anybody else. It's not fair. They're not a part of the show. Not a part of our shared experience right now. Mm -hmm. But a judge said, pothead comic and hot new girlfriend, full custody. You get in touch with the state for when you can see him with somebody else watching. And that's fill in your own backstory. Yeah. That's it. I, that's all I say. So my girlfriend wife went to work. And for the first time, after every, the dust had settled, I was entirely alone with a two-year-old. And he was having a meltdown. And I'm like, let's just count to five and just relax. And he's like, one lefty, 50, five, one, two. I go, stop. No, no, no. Just count to five. Listen to me. Count. And he kept going, 40, A, B, C, five, L. And I'm like, this is not a joke. I thought, maybe he's autistic. And this yeah, is it. Sure. He's comfortable. Yeah. Um, and then he just kept going and going. I'm like, just count to five. And I realized I'm yelling at a two-year-old. And it scared the shit out of me. Then I was alone, and when I'm alone with a two, my son, I'm going, just count to, f like, that's my childhood. Right. No way. So I got down and I prayed. I said, I, I need patience. I need patience. I'm begging you for patience. I'll serve forever. But ding dong, my girlfriend's father, who's a rocket scientist, was coming from jet propulsion laboratories in the valley, just Happened to stop by the house. Never gave him the address. Just hop, happened, stopped by the house to say hi. His name is Meredith. I prayed for patience. It rang my doorbell. That's so amazing. That's I funny. name my, and on stage I go, I name my son after, oh, he gets down on the ground. And he goes, count to five for me. The beautiful gentleman. And he goes, count to five. Hey, Scooter, count to five for me. And he goes, lefty, 50, one, 25, 40, 50. And he goes, that's right. And it was like, Slap my foot. Like, that's another way to parent. Yeah. He got, like, he's not going to walk through high school hallways like, lefty 55. <laughs> right. He'll, he'll get it eventually. Right. You'll yeah. get nothing like it. Uh, and so I, on stage, I go, so I, I named my son after an answered prayer. And I look over in the corner. I go, so fuck you. <laughs> and that <laughs> yeah, gets sure. the big laugh because they were let off the hook. Even sure. though. Um, so, yeah, having a son is twice I've went for full custody Here's what I've noticed historically with me, and that's, and you'll notice this. You didn't ask me this, but it's, I listen to the podcast enough to know. No one is ambivalent about me. Nobody is like, yeah. It's either, oh my God, like I love that guy, man. Or, oh, I fucking, I hate that guy. And if you ask why, I, I don't know. It's just, and I don't know why. And it's been maybe in the last two years, I've been actually able to take the sandbags off the hot air balloon and just realize that's, that's that, that's me. I don't, maybe it's no fear. Maybe it's no, maybe it's because I have joy. Maybe, I don't know what it is because I've never, never, Rick Shapiro, I crossed and left tracks out of, so I wouldn't drown. Um, I've never crossed anybody. I, I've, I only want to be helpful. My, my intent is my worst enemy. I can't tell when I speak my, the difference between my monarchs and my viceroys. Like I'll send out like a nice caring message and somebody brings back this poisonous butterfly like, why, why? And then I exhaust my, I'm a reaction addict. I exhaust my, was, I, re, I exhaust myself trying to make that right. And it took me far too long to realize they're picking up the wrong shit. My heart's my heart, and that's that. And um, it, it's once you have a kid, you really just have to 
knuckle down, knuckle down? Sounds kind of homoerotic. Buckle, buckle down, maybe? Hey, why don't you and me later go to Crunch Fitness in the steam room? We can knuckle down. That does sound, now, and, now it definitely sounds. And fight for what's right. And then when you're going for full custody of a child, that's not ripple effects. That's tsunami after tsunami after tsunami after tsunami. But if you know you're right, you just like having a house on the ocean. Like you just got to weather that. You just, there's going to be damage. There's going to, shingles are going to fly off. There's going to be sand in your stereo. You said that the in in uh, in gasping for airtime. You said this is this is SNL. You know Saturday Night Live. It's the hardest year of my life. Now you've got a small kid, full custody of the small kid, and you just got divorced or you're going through the divorce. Does it still stand that SNL was the hardest year of your life, or have we graduated to this year? Yes, because there was such ambiguity and confusion with every moment of my waking hours, and I was drunk, and I wasn't well. Mm. With my son and with the divorce, when you make a decision like a divorce, people say, well, hey, leave no stone unturned. But what I got from the divorce was I, is certainty. I left my wife certainly because there's no stones left. They disintegrated. I've held them so long. And this is could have been done two years ago, but out of respect to the institution. And I want to be married to this person for the rest of my life. And I'm going to keep giving them an opportunity to show up. So with my son and the wife and the thing, and like that was, that made me go back to AA to get well without drinking or drugging. I was fired from a job because I thought I was on drugs. I did a boys and girls club benefit. And in my mind, that's what I would put with like absolute in court penalty of perjury. That's the show. That's me. And the feedback was, is he on something? Really? And I realized apparently I'm behaving in a way that people that don't know me are calling people that represent me and wondering aloud if I'm on drugs because I'm acting like a dry drunk. Because when I got sober... In 1998, May 5th, Lancashire Boulevard in Riverside, I said the word powerless, and I went, "Uh uh-oh. I never got a sponsor, and I never did the steps. And I'm not advocating. It's not do your thing. But 19 years later, after going through, when you're going through a divorce, houses, I don't care. I can't convince the other side. Take it. I will live in the rectory at St. Monica's Church. I'll jog with Father Tim. I'll play chess with Monsignor Tool. I don't care. But this guy is coming with me because he's never going to be as confused as I was, and he's four at the time. And then the only response to that when you're dealing with fact is personal attacks because desperation is a very distinct scent. And now I'm going to say I'm not necessarily talking about my situation, but Mm -hmm. any business, anything... Desperation has a very distinct scent, and you pick it up. Like when Phil Jackson said posse, right? Do you remember this at all? No. When he said LeBron James and his posse, the coach, uh, the president of the Knicks, Phil Jackson. Ah, uh, okay. I did not know about that. I don't follow 11 that. championship rings. Phil Jackson? Yeah, I know who that is. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> he, said, he said, well, then LeBron and his posse, and all of a sudden, in the American consciousness, posse, like LeBron wasn't happy about it because you can't say that about a black guy. It became this racist idea. Really? It's a cowboy term, for one thing. But okay. That's what you and I think and will continue to think. But the black community as a whole got together, and unbeknownst to you and I, Jordan, it's not okay. But we didn't know it. Yeah. Phil Jackson was in the news for a year. Nobody thinks Phil Jackson is a racist. But desperation has a very distinct scent. The Knicks fucking are a hot bag of shit terrible since he's gotten there. So they just went, and they just never stopped asking him questions. Nobody asked him questions because they thought he might be a racist. They asked him questions because that scent, that wafting thing. So you can find yourself in a situation where the, you can smell the desperation and separate yourself from it and continue. Let me, I'm, uh, yes, SNL, hardest year of my life. Because the divorce, I knew facts that were not okay and not sustainable. I presented these facts to somebody who may or may not have been the person we're speaking about. And I said, these need to be addressed because this is not sustainable. That person's responses led me to believe 
they lacked empathy and compassion and were a little disconnected or a lot disconnected. So I would bring it up again and again and again, and I went insane because I was never looking out for me. So March 14th, I went back to AA to just get my shit together because I was sick. And it was in Redondo Beach. I took a 90-day chip last night. I was like, wow. Congratulations. Thank you. But it's like to not drink and need that. I didn't need that much help on May 5th, 1998. And I'm more sick now getting better than I was on May 6th, May 7th, May 8th, May 9th. And it's because you, people like me who go to the extreme uh, chemically and biologically, that pro, like, what are my faults? What are my defects of character? That's why I love living in liminal space. Like, everybody freaks out with liminal time and space. As a comic, it's all we know. You sit in a hotel room for all day in Albany. Somebody goes, you ready? I'm downstairs. You get in their car. You don't know them. It's weird. Yeah, that it's like pre-Uber. What would you say? Yeah. Whoa! And the guy's like smoking a joint and rocking. Like, it's the acoustic version. And he's just like, whoa! Then you get dropped off at a theater. You walk in and you go on stage. And that hour and a half is now, 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 now. Like the hyperspace button in Star Wars. Like, whoosh, it's real. You walk off stage, back to the hotel room. Airplane is the most liminal space and time there is because you're nowhere. You're on your way and you just left. And then you land and you don't work for a month. That's all we know. But being a comic and having liminal time and space as my life, liminal space is the only time you can really look at you and work on you. Why did I lose that job of 20 years and how do I get another job so that never happens again? So during the marriage, you go, all right, hold on a second. So I had all liminal space to self-fearless moral inventory and excavate until I came out the other end and there was light coming up my ass and out my mouth. And you realize, I can't possibly be wrong here. Um, so it wasn't the hardest because there was data and I could put the I could put a mail in a mail slot. I could write down data in its appropriate place, and I could do the math problem and go that equals divorce, and I'll just do it again a different way. And that was oddly logical. Huh. SNL was not logical because I didn't know what to do. It seems like this seems like there's so much pressure. There's constant rejection. There's constant. You're competing in this weird way um, for on Saturday Night Live and off Saturday Night Live. Doing something cooperative like improv, cooperative like marriage, while also making sure that you get enough screen time for your job. I didn't mean to parallel a marriage with Saturday Night Live, but it almost seems to naturally fit. It you, does. It's gotta, a very good. Yeah. No, it's a perfect coupling. It's strange. You got to do this competitive. Nobody thing. knows how to be. You've been married what six months? Yeah, not who, even one who, month. Who taught you how to be married? Nobody. Probably, Who's going to teach you how to be a father? Oh God, I'm terrified. Yeah, I don't you know. can't be terrified. It's life. You're going to be great. You are going to be great because it's yours and it's all you care about. And whatever you lacked as a kid, you're going to overflow this child to the point of annoyance with. Great. Which Good. is going to teach you whatever things you have with your dad. He's given 100. And it's going to be more, how is that 100? Because it's like we're all waiting for our dads or our moms to like come around right. to give us what we need. That's you in a onesie with anchors on it. I have a son. I'm in the barber shop yelling. I got a son. That's how he feels about you. That's how she feels about you. like we're all waiting for that. That's a hundred. So then you have to like switch it and go and have compassion and realize this person's father, my grandfather, must have been a son of a bitch. <laughs> if this is one hundred and I feel this way and not seen and undervalued and my way is right, I know it's right, but nobody's asking me my opinion, then his father must have been, oh, wow. So you almost like you have to look at your parents like they're wearing like, like an oxygen mask. Like they're not well, they're sad. They were, but then you, it never reached you that sad. Mm -hmm. that's, that's what they did. So you being a dad, you can't have fear and faith at the same time. If you met the gal of your dreams and you wanna have a baby, go, like fear. You want to know what fear is? All right. I don't know if it's fear, but it's as close as I've come. Both my sons were in the neonatal intensive care unit. They were oh, just man. very, they were just young. 
They're just tiny. Premature. They weren't babies. sick. Okay. But there's babies that die. Yeah. There's babies that aren't there when you go the next day. Uh, My son's heart would stop and bing bong, the alarms go bing bong. Because you can't have like wah, wah, Right, because it's just all Watch the time. out, Norton! You have to have quiet alarms, and uh, my son's just goes bing bong, and I see he's flatlining. I look over at a nurse, and she goes, "Grab his big toe." Just you know, how you whisper through a window, even though the person can't hear you. Sure, that's when we should be yelling. Like if your friend's on the inside of the yeah, subway store, you're sure. like, oh, "No, are you going to go around the back? Are you going around the back?" Like right. we whisper. She's whispering from thirty feet. Just grab his toe. Just wiggle his big toe. And I grab my son's big toe. He weighs three pounds, and I wiggle it. Pop, pop. His heart starts. And I'm like, what the? And she goes, it's bradycardia. It's really weird. We just The neonatal intensive care unit nurses at Cedars-Sinai and probably many, many in every hospital now realized if you wiggle the big toe and squeeze it and wiggle it, it restarts the heart of an infant. Who knew you could pulse start a baby? It, like a lawnmower. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but like the fear is when you have that baby and take him home, now all of a sudden this truck you drive is a fucking Fabergé egg. Right, yeah. And there are far too many people around. Right. And you're just driving, and there's this, like, car seat behind you facing the other direction. He's got his own mirror so he can look at himself, even though he can't focus yet. You got your rearview mirror synced up with his rearview mirror so you guys can kind of communicate in this alternate reality you've created (laughs) in these mirrors. And then you're like, red lights, whoa. What if nobody goes and respects the law? Yeah. Like yeah. that's terror. Getting the baby from the hospital to the home and realizing, I don't know how to have a baby. I mean, it was two the first time I was like alone, alone with them. That's a long time. And that to then wake up one day and go, oh, wait, I don't have an instruction manual for this Your thing. Your parents come out, they visit. There's a grandparent. You have a girlfriend. You got, you know, you know, a nanny. You want some help. If you can afford it, you get <clears throat> somebody to hang out. Yeah. Well, come at five in the morning so I can wake up at seven. I live near her parents. That's definitely going to happen. We live 10, 15 minutes away from her parents. So that's why I pay California taxes so that grandma and grandpa can come over and, you know, give us... A, much needed rest at some point. Yes. But then the coupling of a marriage with Saturday Night Live, I think is really brilliant because you don't know how to do it. And they go, well, you got it. Here's the ring. I do. She says, just kick ass. Be, be funny. Be married. Well, where do I hand in the sketches? What do I do when this ha-? Nobody tells you. And what people don't realize before a marriage is, like, people get married because they think it'll improve something. If you have tennis elbow before you get married, you're going to have tennis elbow to, on your 10-year anniversary. Right. It it solves nothing. You have it in both elbows at that point. Because, like, Rob Bell, The Zim Zum of Love, it's a great book in a relationship. There has to be a death to be a marriage because you have to accommodate somebody's life from DNA all the baggage, all the harm, all the trauma, all the tears, all the love, all the laughs, that there's not enough space. So something has to die. And for me, it was the snarky, like my way or the highway. Like, I'm not even sure what all died. Bert Kreischer said, there's no doubt Nikki killed the Tupac that lived inside of you. <laughs> and I went, yeah, because yeah. nice. there's a circle. That Zim Zom is that space between two lovers. Something has to die. And that's that's brave. But you didn't even realize getting married was probably the scariest thing you've ever done. You have to be brave to get married. You have to be so brave. If brave people get married, hell, hell to the lucky ones that refer to those in love, for better. But that you weren't scared because you knew. So on SNL, I knew I was scared because I had a medical problem. But both are very, and there's hopefully not a shelf life to either. But life, uh, what is it, John Lennon? Life is life, life. happens when you're busy making other plans. Yeah. So, so just make sure your next show is hotter. Jake, thank you so much, man. This has been amazing. Well, I can't end on a joke. You can't end hotter on hotter okay. shows. All right, take that out then. Yeah, no, just end on something more profound. Let's just plow through that then. What let, What do you want to leave us with? What are you feeling? Uh, well, first of all, I'm I'm really happy to be on the podcast. I, w- I would love to come on again and speak anything specifically you want to talk about. Yeah, but, happy and to have you. the fact that you knew so much about the book thrills me. Um, we do things that we don't even re- like the fact that you're just this whole thing was the book. And 
you tied it to modern day. So you like time traveled with me. Like I had to go back in these scenarios and I had to go back and reconnect these dots in this linear time. I didn't expect that. So thank you for doing that. But also just your, your pot. This is what, this is important. Your podcast is important. There are podcasts where guys get together with their buddies and they talk about weed and hockey and like, Hey man, who likes teeth? Like there's a podcast for anything. Yours, when I discovered it, I, it's the only, th it's, there's not one episode where I don't go, holy shit. That lady said the exact same sentence 14 times and sounded different 14 different ways because of where her hands were. Do you know what I mean? Like it's a really important podcast. So A, thank you. B, the universe that I discovered it. Oh, I was going to be on a while ago. And I'm like, let me take a listen. Right. And your guests, like Roy Woods, father Roy figure. Roy Jr., yeah. I yeah. never would have thought I was going to glean something from another comic. But like that depth of it. And you're, I feel like I've uh, not gotten to the depths of the ones I'm listening to. But I, I will say this. I'm just thrilled that I got to talk to you and just don't stop. No plan to stop, man. You know how comedy teams become the greatest comedy team of all time? By not breaking up. No one's pulled it off. Nobody has died a comedy team. So this podcast, if you just keep going, I'm telling you, you're, it's, you're helping. You've helped me a lot. Well, I'm glad to hear that. I'm glad to hear that. And I'm glad to help. You've real like the narcissistic continuum like that. I sent that to 14 different people. Maybe I'm maybe three. I like to exaggerate to clarify. That's fine. That's it's part of the game. And thank you for having me on for the 14th time. You're welcome. Thanks for coming on, brother. Buddy, you're the best. <laughs>